I love the feeling that I'm surrounded by faces that I love. But I'm totally convinced that in 10 years' time, I will slowly lose those connections. It is possible to have a test, but I haven't had the test yet, so I don't know what my gene status is. Mum had her eye on the future all the time. She wanted science to find a solution to Alzheimer's disease. At the time when Mum was no longer able to have MRI scans, that's about the same time that I started having mine. I mean, it's giving my life some purpose to think that I'm contributing to it. Carol, if I may start with you, when did you first discover that your father had Alzheimer's disease? Well, it was diagnosed in 1982. He started to forget things and his behaviour seemed slightly strange. My mother went to the doctor and, um, and they in fact said, well, this is Alzheimer's disease. And then in 1983, my aunt, his sister, was diagnosed. And then the following year, my uncle. I started to think, gosh, you know, this is three people in one family. It seems that this is just more than a coincidence. There must be something more to this. And uh, I was sure there must be somebody somewhere who would be interested. In 1987, I was at St Mary's Hospital Medical School in West London. Nobody knew the causes of Alzheimer's disease. It was just seen as an inevitable consequence of ageing. It was not genetic. We wrote in the Alzheimer's Society newsletter and asked people if they had Alzheimer's disease in their family, if they had more than one case, could they write to us? And the letters immediately started to come in. Carol had drawn her family tree. So we could see there were six affected living individuals and they had all developed the disease in their mid fifties. I thought we could use a family like the Jennings family to really identify the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. It took almost four years of research, but we made a breakthrough. We discovered there was a mutation that was inherited by all the affected family members, but not by their unaffected brothers and sisters and cousins. I knew that we could test the next generation and the people who were currently unaffected and tell them whether or not they were going to get the disease. With me is Carl Jennings. Now there is a test which you could take which would tell you definitely whether you would or would not get it, is that yes, right? Yes, that's right. Are yes. you going to take that test? Well, for the moment, no, I've decided that I won't. <laughs> I've got to die of something. We all have. So, you know, why no? Why not just take it when it happens? Mum started becoming symptomatic at 50. I'm 38, so I could start developing symptoms in 10 years. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of thinking he has the gene and all the implications for that. Well, I'm still hoping he doesn't, because the thing that makes John John is like how his, his interests and the way he interacts with people and talking about anything and everything and being passionate about it. And so, the possibility that he couldn't be that person is, is, is difficult. Anyone in John's situation, the decision is often, should I or should I not know my gene status? But the knowledge about your genetic status is something you can't unknow. The desire to have the test has kind of ebbed and flowed. Because I've always kind of assumed that I do have the mutation, um, as I think maybe is quite a universal experience from what I've seen from the people that I've spoken to. Do not double guess the gene. You know, absolutely do uh, not uh, decide uh, uh. that you know whether or not you've got your gene. Your decision about whether or not to be tested, and I believe this passionately, has to be based either because you can't cope with living with that uncertainty, mm -hmm. But the only other reason, in, certainly in my experience of having seen many people in this process, is if it's going to change what you would otherwise do. What would you do differently? <laughs> so we, we were planning for quite a long time, because Matt is South African, we were wondering about going and living in South Africa for a little while. And I applied for my residence years and years ago, and it came through a few weeks ago. Okay. And so now that's an option. And um, 
there's a discussion we need to have because that's why I'm now leaning again towards not knowing because I do think life is short and we have to make, make the most of it. Yeah, for sure. It's complicated, it's complicated. Lecanemab is the first drug that's got formal approval, so full approval, which is that's unbelievable. Amazing. So yeah, it's yeah. the first time, yeah, in Alzheimer's disease. I almost feel a little bit more at ease, like being here makes me think like I've actually, it actually makes me feel like I've got more time. It doesn't make me feel like I've got as much time as everybody else necessarily if I have the mutation, which obviously I don't know. But it but takes like, that pressure like cooker off a bit. It's taken some of that pressure off, yeah. yeah. And so I can feel more relaxed about maybe not knowing my status just yet. I get goosebumps down the back of my neck. This is evidence that what we've been working towards all these years is actually finally coming to fruition. And it really does change things. It has a modest effect, this drug. It's not the, the magic bullet that's going to completely reverse the disease. But what it is is the beginning. It's the foundation stone that we can build on and really make treatments that make a meaningful difference to their lives. Every time I hear about all the progress that's been made, I can link that back to that letter that Mum wrote, and I'm so proud of her for that. When the gene was discovered, she said, it may not be any good for me, but I hope it will help my children, because she knew it would be the beginning of the end. I'm so optimistic.